So hello everybody, my name is Ron Wasserman. I am a musician with the New York City Ballet. I have been a musician there for well over 30 years, about 35 years. So that would be, I think that would be before both all of you were born. Was anybody born over 35 years ago? Yeah, I didn't think so. I have played music for lots and lots and lots of dancers. All the dancers who have ever been through the New York City Ballet. Also, our orchestra there at the theater has played for other dance companies. San Francisco Ballet, we have played for the Royal Ballet, we've played for the Australian Ballet, we've played for, gosh, I can't even remember how many ballet companies that have come through that theater that our orchestra has played for. So I have played a lot, a lot of music. So most of what we play in the orchestra for ballet is what you would call classical music. Classical music is, I don't want to get too much into theory or musicology, I want to talk more about dance stuff, but just as a very simple rundown. So classical music is an encompassment of all, a whole bunch of different kinds of music that have been written since the 1600s up until now. And you can imagine that music has changed from 1600s until now. And there's many different what they call periods in music. If we just go to the kind of periods of music that they use for dance, we would start with approximately the Baroque period, which would be the 1700s, let's round this all up, 1700s, late 1600s to 1700s. That's what we call the Baroque period. And some of the composers from that period are, that you've heard of are Bach. Have, everybody's heard of Bach, right? So let's, let's pull up a um, Bach well-tempered clavier piano work. She's going to be the DJ for today. <laughs> anyway, oh, you do? Okay, so you guys know Bach. So we, and this is not like, so I don't have to remind you of it though, but, and another composer, I, right, everybody knows this piece, right? This is actually a really good ballet piece. I'm sure it's been done many different times. Um, another great Baroque composer is Handel. Let's pull up um, the water music of Handel. He was uh, around the same time as Bach. And then after, uh, yeah. So it's kind of old style but it's kind of, there's a rhythmic drive to it, right? That's great. Um, so then, so that was the Baroque period. The next period of music that is part of classical music is called the classical period. And it's kind of funny that they call all of classical music classical, but there really was only one period. And that was approximately 1750 to 1800. And classical, the, the most famous classical composer, does anybody know? I'm gonna see how much you guys know. This is a composer you've heard, yes. No, Beethoven was the next period. And no wrong answers. I'm not gonna be mad about any wrong answers. No, he's, he's, he's coming up. Mozart is the most famous classical composer. So let's pull up uh, Mozart Symphony Number no. 41 if we can. Let's see what that sounds like. Ah, here we go. So you can see between Baroque and Baroque and classical period, music really progressed a lot. This is pretty danceable too, isn't it? This has been done a few times, I think. Okay, that's great. So there are some other composers, famous composers, not as famous as Mozart, from the classical period. The second most famous one is a guy called Haydn. We don't have to listen to anything by him unless you want to find a random Haydn piece. 
Here's, this is really arcane information. This is what they teach in all music classes, so I'm going to have to teach it to you. Now, the next period, by the way, is called the Romantic period, and that started from, let's, let's call that the entire uh, 19th century, which is from 1800 to 1900. Where do you think they get these names Baroque, Classical, Romantic from? Where do they get those terms? Anybody have any idea? I'll tell you, they get it from art, the art school, from art history, whereas the, there was the Baroque art, there was Renaissance art, there was classical art, there was romantic art, and then of course there's various subsections, which I don't want to get into, because this is not a class that we're going to have a test in. And consequently, they also name you know, schools of dance the same way. And it all comes after the art schools. So romantic period from 1900, from 1800 to 1900. Beethoven was the most famous composer. And guess who Beethoven's teacher was? Was Haydn, who I mentioned about the classical period. Now he, Beethoven also took a few lessons with Mozart, which is kind of fun that the most famous composer of the next century had a, as a teacher, Mozart and Haydn. So let's pull up um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. This is a piece that everybody knows. I'm going to try to keep it to stuff we know, just so we get it in our heads of what we're talking about. Right? Now, this is not a very danceable piece, though, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows this, right? Who hasn't heard this piece? Everybody in the world has heard this piece. Okay, so now we're, we're in the Romantic period. And I believe what we think of as modern classical ballet started to, to develop concurrently throughout the 19th century, where all the, I won't say students of Beethoven, but everybody, every composer who worked in the 19th century was influenced by Beethoven. And he, you know, he was their god. This is when we start to get the masterpieces of, of, of modern, of dance. Who can name somebody from the 19th century the most famous dance composer? And this is a name you've heard of. Yes, I knew you were going to know that one. Right? Phew, they got it. Tchaikovsky, we have the culmination of the, the what period are we in again? 1900. 1900, but what do we call it? Romantic, right. So we are in the culmination of the Romantic school of composing for dance is Tchaikovsky. There was nobody better ever for, as a dance composer. Let's preface that by saying Music for dance, for ballet, I won't say dance, music for ballet can be some of the greatest music ever written and some of the worst, but we won't go into too much of that, especially those, those long 19th century ballets that go on and on and on and on, those long story ballets from the 19th century that, that were not Tchaikovsky. I'm going to quiz you guys. How many ba full-length ballets did Tchaikovsky write? Take a guess. Remember, no, don't be embarrassed. Three, that's right. Okay, can, let's, let's, let's see if you guys can name them. Swan Lake, Nutcracker, you got it. Okay, so all three of them are among the, the best music ever written. The greatest masterpieces of music. I'm not even talking about just dance. Whose favorite, and we're just talking the music now, not the dance. Whose favorite is the Nutcracker? Raise your hand. Whose favorite is Sleeping Beauty? The music. Just of those three, not of your favorite mu piece of music ever. Whose favorite is Swan Lake? Yay, you guys agree with me. Yeah, Swan Lake is, is one of the greatest pieces of music ever written. Let's, let's pull up the beginning of Swan Lake. Now here's, here I'm going to give you a little musicology lesson. Listen to the melody. 
Listen to the melody carefully. Let's listen to that same bit again. Go to act two. Now listen to the melody here. So we had dee da do da do dee da dom, right? Now let's listen to act two. Sounds similar? You don't think of that when you listen to the music. Okay, let's, let's um, turn that off for a second. So what he does there, and he has the same instrument, so the first one is Da di da 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 di da da. Right, the first one goes down, and then Act Two, he's da do da 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 da. He's going up, and it's basically almost the same melody, but he just does that little teeny little turnaround, and that's what makes it a masterpiece. Believe it or not, it's all the other stuff that surrounds it, of course, but just those little turns. Really, in all music, that's what separates you know the masterpieces from just a run-of-the-mill piece of music is how it relates to each other within the piece of music. And I'm sure you've studied choreography. There's, that happens all the time in choreography. It's all, there's a word for it, and it's called development. And you have an, and which applies to, to dance and music. You take an idea, and you don't just go on to another idea. You, you see how far you can take that, that idea, changing it around, making variations, etc., etc. Tchaikovsky wrote three ballets, which are done all the time, all over the place. But many, many, many choreographers use other pieces that Tchaikovsky wrote to, to make dances from, especially the founder of the New York City Ballet that, you know, George Balanchine. He pretty much made a career out of making dances by Tchaikovsky and, and Stravinsky, which we'll, let's see, I'm not sure if we'll talk about Stravinsky this time or next time. Off the top of my head, I'm going to think of a few pieces that Tchaikovsky wrote that other choreographers have pulled out of dance. And it's all, so much of it is danceable. Let's pull up Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto number two. This is one that um, hardly ever gets played as a concerto, like a pianist in a concert, but it gets danced to a lot, because Balanchine did a ballet. It kind of sounds like a ballet, doesn't it? So Balanchine heard this piece, and he said, wow, that sounds like a ballet. Let's make it into a ballet, and that's what he did. Um, well, the, the most famous one that is done all over the world constantly is the Serenade for Strings. Let's listen to a bit of that. This is, one, this is Balanchine's, one of his most famous dances. You guys are already doing the poses. So you guys know this. Now, here's a little little funny thing about this piece. You know how it ends slow? In the original piece of music, there's four what we call movements. In classical music, we have a big piece, and it's put into movements. And dancers use movements, too. They use that terminology, too. In the Tchaikovsky, let's, let's pull up the um, last movement of the Serenade for Strings, movement four. And this, this last movement comes in the middle of the ballet. So what Balanchine did was he took a movement from the middle, which was a slow movement, and he put it on the end. And it works fantastically in the ballet, but the original piece ends with, we get to the back. Okay. So this is in the middle of the ballet, right? Everybody remember this part? This is actually the end of the piece of music, which is interesting. 
So that was Balanchine who had that idea to turn things around. So he was very knowledgeable about music too, which is always good if you're going to choreograph to it. Let, yes, let's listen to Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet, which you're going to know this music, but it's not as famous as Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet music. But Tchaikovsky did write a piece. Now, he did not, he did not write this piece as a dance piece, but choreographers have used it, of course. Let's, let's just fast forward, because we're going to find the, um, the famous melody. Oh, here we go. Let it run for a while. So there's a term for this kind of music. And a lot of these forms, there's a form. What, when we say form in music, what we're talking about, can people hear me if I talk over the music? Okay, good. When we say form, we're talking about the shape of the music. And there's, a there's some very specific things that you can do with music. Like you can write a symphony, which is a few movements of music just for, for an orchestra. You can have songs. You can have what we call this. Now this, this is a very special form. It's called a tone poem. And what, what they mean about it by a tone poem is a piece that's for orchestra, but it's not a symphony. It's usually one movement, and it tells a story. And this piece is telling the story of Romeo and Juliet. We should listen to a little Prokofiev later, but we... So, you know, the story of Romeo and Juliet, it's, it's not a happy story. It's a, it's a sad story. And there's a lot of drama in it, so that's why that piece sounded so, so you know, Dramatic. Does anybody else have any other favorite Tchaikovsky pieces? Okay. Let's listen to one more Tchaikovsky piece that I know. Okay, I've got one. If I can remember his name. There was a choreographer who came to the New York City Ballet once. And he said, I want to do a piece to a Tchaikovsky symphony um, that nobody had ever done. Let's pull up. Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Four, Fourth Movement. Oh, there's a whole list. It doesn't matter. Oh, there we go. That's what I was looking for. So somebody came in and said, "Let's choreograph to this piece of music." It's really fast. So this is a Tchaikovsky symphony. Tchaikovsky wrote six symphonies, and almost all of, except for those three famous ballets, almost all his music was composed just as music, just to be listened to. But of course, when you, have, when you add dance, it enhances the music. You know, the, the music enhances the dance, and the dance enhances the music. I, I don't know if there are, are two art forms that are so bound together that way, you know, as dance and music. It is good that you guys know a little bit about music, even just me rambling on and on. You know, you'll pick, you'll pick it up. I don't want to talk too much about um, the, the lesser composers than Tchaikovsky, but there's definitely some that are, that are worth talking about. Who, what are some of you guys' other favorite classical ballets? Just call them out. Don Quixote, okay. You know, when they do Don Quixote at um, ABT, they, what they, now here's, I'm going to give you some inside scoop about music in the ballet. They often put in other pieces. They take other pieces from other composers if they need a filler piece. And each production is going to be a little different. Don Quixote is something that I personally have played a handful of times or less. What about, um, has anybody seen um, Capella? You guys know Capella? That's, that has some beautiful music. Let's pull up any, any part of Capella. Capella was composed by Delib, who is, um, he was a French composer. Yeah, you guys 
It's interesting when we're, when, we're, when we're talking about just the music, you guys still want to move to it, right? What's that? Christmas, when like sugar plum fairies oh, everywhere, yeah. you go to the store and they're like... Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, for me, it's different whenever I hear the, the, the Nutcracker commercials. I have to tune it out. I have to tune it out. Take a guess. I know I'm asking you guys to guess a lot, but this is all in fun, right? We're all smiling about this. How many times do you think that I have played the Nutcracker? Take a wild guess. Just throw out a number. You look like you want to say something. She's counting. Okay. <laughs> you could, all right, I'll give you a hint. Remember, I've been in the ballet for over 30 years, and, and it's done about 50 times a year. You're, you're close, but a little low. You're, that's, you're around, that's, that's about right. So I'm very familiar with, with the Nutcracker. And the thing about the Nutcracker, and I don't know, are we even allowed to talk about the Nutcracker in the summer? Is it against the, is it against the law? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the music is so, such a masterpiece that it, it kind of almost doesn't matter how many times you play it, you can always find something in it. There have been years where it gets a little boring to me. I remember when I had small children at home, that was some trying times for everything. And everything else in your life kind of takes a secondary uh, moment to raising little children. So then the Nutcracker kind of got to be a little bit of an annoyance to me. But now, still, after all these years, um, it's, it's, very, it's very enjoyable. Let's talk about the orchestra for, for a minute, as long as we're, we're just um, throwing out some information. The average ballet orchestra is basically the same size group as what we would call a symphony orchestra. Now, I've used the word symphony before. Do you remember what, what that was in context about? It was about a form of music called a symphony. Um, now, they call it a symphony because a symphony orchestra will play it. Or maybe they call a symphony orchestra a symphony orchestra because they play symphonies. I'm not sure which comes first, the chicken or the egg there. But a symphony in a pit or on stage. Has, has anybody ever been to a concert of just an orchestra, like a huge orchestra with like 100 people in it at, at Lincoln Center or at Carnegie Hall? Yeah. That generally will be slightly larger size group, but it works like this. There's four sections of musicians. There's strings, there's woodwinds, there's brass, and there's percussion. The strings are unique in that we have five different we have four instruments in the strings in a symphony there are many many in the world there are many many instruments that are stringed instruments guitars are one which is not in a symphony but we have in there we have violins violas cellos and basses now i happen to play the bass by the way just so you know who i am what's unique about the strings in a symphony is that everybody who's playing violin will play the same notes they'll all play it together and everybody who's playing viola will play the same notes. Or everybody who's playing the cello or the bass, we will play the same notes. Now, there's a few exceptions, but we don't have to go into that. Whereas all the other instruments, the woodwinds, which are flutes, clarinets, um, bassoons, oboes. And the reason they call them woodwinds is because they're played with your wind as you blow into it, your wind being your breath. And most of them are made out of wood, except for the flutes, they're all metal. Although in the old days, flutes used to be made out of wood. And the brass instruments, which are made out of brass, they're also played with your breath. The brass instruments in this, and now the woodwinds, they all play their own notes. Every player there plays their own notes. Brass too. 
Every, we have trumpets, trombones, and tuba, and French horns in the brass section. And they all play their own notes. And the percussion, everybody knows what percussion is. It's drums, cymbals, um, blocks, and xylophones, and all kinds of things like that. Those instruments all play their own notes. But the special thing about the strings is that we're all playing the same thing. Now, what makes an orchestra bigger or smaller in those cases is you can have, let's say, well, I'll do, use the basses. In my orchestra, we have four bass players, and we all play the same. In the, say, the New York Philharmonic, which would be an orchestra that goes on stage at Lincoln Center, they will have 10 bass players playing the same notes, and it's the same for the violins. In my orchestra in the ballet, we have approximately 20 violins. In the stage symphony, we'll have 40 violins, etc. That was all an around to get to the point of, it's basically the same animal as a symphony orchestra that we're playing in the pit. In my orchestra, there are approximately 65 players in what I mentioned before, the New York Philharmonic, there's about 100. Also, there's an orchestra, we were just talking about it, there's an orchestra at the Metropolitan Opera, and they're an orchestra of oh, about 90 players, so they have maybe just a few violins and, and strings less than the other things. I've talked a lot. Anybody have any questions about anything so far? Because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just talking, 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 yes. Um, because it's so, sometimes it's so fast, we right. especially the Russians who slow things right. so much. Right, yes. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, generally, if you're going to play for dance, you're going to be, understand that part of your job is you have to accommodate the, the dancers. You're not going to get too frustrated, except occasionally, as you were saying, certain dance companies, they will slow things down so much that the music is almost, it almost sounds like a different piece of music. So that can get frustrating every so often. We, we'll, we'll grumble to ourselves, but we're not going to make a big deal out of it. Oh, yes. Who's your favorite composer? My favorite composer of the ones we've spoken about so far, I'd have to say Tchaikovsky and Bach. Bach, I think Bach is um, probably my favorite composer of all because, and Bach is not done so much for dance. He, he is done, but not, it's not as much as Tchaikovsky or some of the others. Um, Bach, I consider one of the great geniuses of, of all the arts in all the genres throughout history. You know, I think if you ask any musician in the world who's heard of him, they'll say that Bach was the greatest genius of music. Kind of like, everybody's heard of Shakespeare, right? Everybody says he was the greatest writer of all time. You know, Bach is kind of on that. But then, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be your favorite, but I do happen to like, love Bach. Um, and Tchaikovsky, I like as somebody who has worked in the field of music professionally, and I think dancers, now you're going to remember this your whole career. There is nobody in the history of music who has employed more musicians and dancers than Tchaikovsky, and he's still doing it 140 uh, years after he died. Without, without Tchaikovsky ballets, there would be no dance companies and there would be no dance almost, you can't say that, but there would be no classical ballet. And I also happened, as I say, I also happen to love Tchaikovsky because I can play his music over and over and over again and still be happy about it. And that's not always the case because sometimes you can, who here has seen Phantom of the Opera, right? Everybody saw that, right? A lot of people saw it. That show ran for 35 years and the musicians in that pit, some of them were there the entire time, every night for 35 years. And that can get a little difficult. 
And as good as Phantom is, it's not of the holistic quality that, that some of those Tchaikovsky masterpieces are. That can get a little bit trying to do that over and over and over again. Any other questions? Next week, or week after next, we're going to talk about what comes after the Romantic period. When was the Romantic period? 1802 to 1900, right. The next period, broadly speaking, which started in the, in the turn of the 20th century, which was 1900, we call the modern period. And that's when things start to get really, really complicated because it's seemingly every year there was a different school of music and then they all compounded and they went, even in classical music we had the, now these are also based on schools of, of painting. We had the Impressionists, the Serialists. We'll get to those next time. And we're still talking about classical music. And I know I'm throwing out so much information to you guys, <laughs> which I apologize for, but it's hard to do it otherwise. Because th th as, as we say, you know, the story, if my lecture is the story of music and dance, it's just so broad, you know, I'm just touching on it. Let's continue with what we call sort of the end of the Romantic period. Now, there were many composers who went into the 20th century who were still composing in a Romantic style. And we, somebody mentioned it, but let's go back to one of the great masterpieces. We were talking about Romeo and Juliet. We listened to Tchaikovsky. Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet is one of the great masterpieces pretty much written in a romantic style, but with a modern sensibility. I, I should be able to pull this off the top of my head, but I can't. Uh, when was Romeo and Juliet written? Let's, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look up Prokofiev. 35. 1935, okay, it's a little bit off. So that's well into the 20th century, which we call the modern period but it is still what we would call romantic music. So let's pull up some, I think any movement of Romeo and Juliet would be, we can listen to. So we've got the balcony scene happening now. What does it say there? Does it just say Romeo or does it say balcony? Oh yeah. Pull up pull up the balcony scene. Oh yeah. Yeah. That is extremely romantic. Extremely romantic. Everybody knows what's happening in the balcony scene. This is when the first time that Romeo and Juliet meet without anybody else. It's maybe the only time they meet in person, just by themselves. So, remember I said that ballet, music for dance, for ballet, encompasses some of the greatest music ever written. This is another one of those pieces. Yeah. This is a, on a level of the of Swan Lake and the Nutcracker. Still a balcony scene. Tybalt's death, and you're going to see now why it's romantic, but it has a more modern influence. This is the fight scene. Yeah, yeah. You can listen to this. This is, I think, this is the sword fight scene. Mark 
let's listen to Mercutio stuff. I'm looking for the part where you hear the pound, 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 pound. I think that's. Yeah. So everybody can hear where we're getting more modern sounding, right? This does not sound like Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. Okay, so there's the basses going. Boom. That's what I play. Boom. Oh no, that's the timpani in the bass drum. That's supposed to be his heartbeat. So that's what Prokofiev is doing there, is he's using the orchestra to show his heartbeat slowing down. And then he dies, and you guys know the story. So that we will see a lot more in, as we get more towards modern music, we'll see effects rather than just melody. Effects like pounding and pounding. Not to say that Tchaikovsky and those people didn't evoke things in the story, but it gets more obvious, you know, that they're not, that they're trying to use the orchestra to really illustrate, you know, exactly what's supposed to happen on the stage. Uh, we only got one answer, but give me some other favorites. You, you're the one who told me about um, Don Quixote, right? Who said Don Quixote? Oh, no, that was you. What was your favorite? Giselle. Giselle. Okay, let's pull up a little Giselle. And you guys are going to tell me what period of music you think this is from. you guys do the choreography as you listen to it. Okay, who? Now, I know I said no quiz, but this doesn't count for anything. Remember, we have Baroque we've talked about, we have classical period, we have the romantic period, and we have the modern period. What period do you think Giselle is from? Yes, romantic. Yes, you can really tell. Um, let's play a little game. I'm going to think of a piece by a composer that you don't know from a certain period and you're going to tell me, because I don't want to say the name of the composer that we've already talked about. No, it doesn't have to be ballet. Let's pull up a piece by, let's pull up a Vivaldi Violin Concerto. You guys are going to tell me what, what period this is from. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, who thinks this is Baroque? Let's pull up one, actually, you know what? Let's pull up one more Vivaldi random piece, just to give them a little more information. Okay. This is a very famous piece. The 
is used in a lot of TV commercials, this piece. Almost as many as the Nutcracker. Okay, who thinks this is Baroque? Raise your hands. Who, don't look at anybody else now. Yeah. <laughs> They're all like, wait a minute. Okay, who thinks this is, what's the next period? Classical. Who thinks this is romantic? Who thinks this is, mo who thinks this is modern? Okay, this is Baroque. Actually, Vivaldi was one of the people that Bach learned from. So he was a very important composer. Bach actually, now back in the day, way back then, you couldn't just turn on the radio or, the, or go on the internet and listen to whatever piece of music in the history of the world. Bach actually had to travel to other countries, often by coach or walking. He would walk for weeks because he had heard of a famous musician that he wanted to learn from. And he would go there and just to hear them play, just because he'd heard of them. And that's how he learned. So things were tough back then, you know. We have so much resources. Even from the time when I was a young student learning about music to today, like if I had heard about, as I say, I studied the bass. If I wanted to listen to a certain bass player that I'd heard of, I had to like f either find the record of his to buy or ask a friend to lend it to me, and then I would have to listen to that record, which are now, you know, vinyl, which we now call vinyl. That was the only way to listen to music unless you heard it live, compared to today where we all have access to whatever we want, any dance performance in history practically, you know. So you guys are really lucky that, you're, that you have those resources for you. Okay, let's play that game one more time. Let me find a composer and I'm just gonna pull him up. This is gonna be really obscure. Uh, the name of the composer is Berlioz, B-E-R-L-I-O-Z. Pull up anything by Berlioz Symphony. And it's gonna be called the Symphony Fantastique probably is gonna pop up. Let's see what we get. <laughs> thinks this is classical? Who thinks it's romantic? It is from the Romantic era. Um, Berlioz was writing in the middle of the 19th century, so like 19, the, the 1830s, 40s. Okay, let's do one more. Is this game fun for you? Okay, this is going to be another obscure one. Let's pull up a composer named um, is, it's pronounced Gluck, but it's spelled G-L-U-C-K. Let's pull up whatever comes up under Christoph Gluck. And we'll guess together. Well, I know, but we'll guess the name of the, we'll guess the piece. I don't know what piece is coming up. Well, this is a good dance piece. Okay, this is a really tricky one, and if you get this one wrong, you don't have to feel bad. Who thinks this is Baroque? Who thinks this is classical? Who thinks this is romantic and modern? Everybody knows it's not modern. Okay, this is actually a classical, from the classical period, but it is very, very early, almost before Mozart, um, almost still, almost Baroque with Baroque influences. 
Okay, well, we're almost out of, we're just about out of time. So what we're going to talk about next time, I'll see you guys in about two weeks. We're going to talk about the modern era of music. Now, what happens in the modern era of, excuse me, the modern era of music and dance? This is what happens. It's not just classical. Now, remember, there's two ways of calling classical music. There's the classical era, and then there's classical music, right? Everybody remembers that, right? What happens in the modern era is that choreographers are not just choreographing to classical music anymore. They're choreographing to all kinds of music. So that opens up an entire new world. And this started in the, middle, the early middle part of the 20th century. And just so you know where I'm coming from, besides playing in an orchestra, and this is going to answer your question about who one of my favorite composers is, the kind of music I like best after classical music, or maybe even with classical music, is jazz music. And jazz music becomes, we'll, we'll study that a little bit next time, but the, the greatest composer of jazz music who lived from well, basically through the 20th century was a guy named Duke Ellington and surprisingly not choreographed to enough. He needs to have more. Maybe this is a future thing where Duke Ellington will be recognized for his dance choreography. Now that is not true in one regard. For popular dance, he was choreographed to extensively, but not in classical dance as we're calling it. So anyway, thank you, everybody. I will see you in a couple weeks. I really appreciated you listening. And any questions you have afterwards, just come up and ask me.